Good morning, all. Before we begin, let us pray. Father, we approach your throne of grace boldly in the name of Christ Jesus, our King. Father, I ask that you loose my tongue, that I would exalt your name, that you open the ears of these people, that they would hear your word proclaimed in their midst today. May it all be for Christ's honor and glory, and in his name we pray. Amen. I was approached by Brother Clay Hall late last week uh, in hopes that I would be willing to fill the position that was left open by, by Fair Sahani as uh, he would be absent due to illness. And obviously I took him up on this opportunity and it is my privilege and honor to be standing before you today. The topic for dis today's discussion that I inherited from the former speaker was abortion our na uh, national sin, and while I understand the intent of the topic and its title, and while I do believe that abortion is a heinous sin, worthy of the strictest of penalties, I do not believe that I would place abortion in the position of supremacy above all of the other sins perpetrated by this current American empire. Abortion is a symptom. It is an indication of a far greater sin that infects this land. Namely, as a civil body, we have neglected our duties toward the Creator and have denied His divine right to rule and reign over us. Abortion is the premeditated murder of the most innocent of unborn children, those that are in utero, those that are in the womb of their mothers, and as such, it stands as the most monstrous of crimes that one human being can commit toward another. It stands even head and shoulders above patricide, the murder of a father, or matricide, the murder of one's own mother, both of which we would agree are morally reprehensible. Abortion holds a unique place in our world for in it, we see the amalgamation of both procreation and extermination. We see the act that led to the conception of this new image bearer as one instituted by God for the promotion of human flourishing, now being maligned and reviled in the snuffing out of this newly formed human life. Those who would enthusiastically commit this odious act and actively promote and prescribe it fit within the category of those listed in the final verses of Romans chapter 1. And I quote, People having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, and evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, they are slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unfeeling, and unmerciful. But all of these things, all of these sins listed here, just like the issue of abortion, are not the root of the problem. They are simply a symptom of a greater problem. And let us look again at the beginning of that passage of Scripture in Romans 1.28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God. They did not see fit to acknowledge God. These atrocious sins do not spring forth ex nihilo. Rather, these sins are merely the outward manifestation of a disbelieving and rebellious heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These things are what defiles a person. And the good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Abortion exists because man has a heart 
problem. And you may say, I agree, amen, preacher, we already know that. Then why aren't we acting like we know that? Before we dive into that any further, let us take a walk back in time for a moment. After all, abortion was not a 20th century American creation. To quote King Solomon, there's nothing new under the sun. From the very foundation of human civilization outside the Garden of Eden, we see that man has been devising new, innumerable forms of murder. As the Israelites were coming toward their entrance into the promised land of Canaan, God spoke through Moses, saying, You shall also say to the sons of Israel, Anyone from the sons of Israel, or from the strangers residing in Israel, who gives any of his children unto Molech, shall certainly be put unto death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will also set my face against that man, and I will cut him off from among his people, because he has given some of his children to Molech, as so to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. If the people of the land, however, should ever disregard that man, whenever he gives any of his children unto Molech, so as to not put him unto death, then I myself will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut off from, the, from their people both him and all of those who play the prostitute with him by playing the prostitute with Molech. Find that in Leviticus chapter 20. Here we see the prohibition against one sacrificing his own offspring on the altar of a false god, Molech. Molech is often depicted as possessing a human body with a, with a bull's head. His statue was usually made of bronze with outstretched arms and a belly that would open up as a furnace. These parents would deliver their children up to the priests of Moloch to pass through the fire, as the word says, or in layman's terms, to be, born, to be burned alive in order to secure favor and prosperity for this false deity. Remember that motivation, favor and prosperity. Leviticus chapter 20 is not the first time that God mentions this prohibition against this evil act. Just two chapters prior in Leviticus 18.21, lying sandwiched between numerous sexual injustices, God tells the Israelites once again, you shall not give any of your children to offer them unto Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defile yourselves by any of these things, for by all these things the nations which I am driving out from before you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled, therefore I have brought its punishment upon it. So the land has vomited out its inhabitants. But as for you, you are to keep my statutes and my judgments. And you shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native nor the stranger who resides among you. For the people of the land who were there before you did all of these abominations, and the land has become defiled. So that the land will not vomit you out, should you defile it as it vomited out the nations which were before you. For whoever does any of these abominations, those persons who do so shall be cut off from among their people. So you are to keep your commitment to me, not to practice any of the abominable customs which have been practiced before you, so that you do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. Both of these passages of Scripture vividly demonstrate God's absolute abhorrence concerning this particularly wicked form of infanticide. Both instances, in both instances, we see his justice and his holy wrath being threatened against these people. There is no beating around the bush. God is direct in his holy hatred for such abominable acts. And in both instances, we see this repulsive act being associated with what? A false deity, a false god. You see, these two elements are inseparable. 
infanticide, feticide, or as we commonly call it, abortion, is always associated with the worship of a false deity. As mentioned earlier, there is nothing new under the sun. This parallels our own experiences now in the 21st century. We have to ask the question, did these laws or prohibitions against this malevolent act actually prevent infanticide in Israel? No, it did not. Solomon, supposedly the wisest king in all of Israelite history, invited this abomination into his kingdom in 1 Kings chapter 11. Please turn with me there if you would. 1 Kings chapter 11. Let us read this narrative. Let's begin reading in verse 3. He, speaking of Solomon, had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after the Ashtoreth, the god the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. But Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully, as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did with all his foreign wives, who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and because you have not kept my covenant and my statute, which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. We see here all of the elements that lead to the slaughter of the innocent. Sexual sin and the worship of false deities. Solomon's sexual sin, by accumulating all of these wives, these princesses, these concubines, had opened the door for these demonic forces to invade the kingdom of Israel. And to, due to this, the judgment of God is brought to bear against Solomon, against Solomon's household, and against the nation as a whole. But did this shattering of the kingdom of Israel prevent or withhold this evil of infanticide from propagating? Sadly, it did not. These evils continued perpetually until the Assyrian destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. In Judah, the righteous king Josiah, 16 generations removed from Solomon. In 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 10, it says that he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, so that no one would make his sons or daughters pass through the fire for Molech, so finally, we see the end of these atrocities in Judah, right? Sadly, no. Not even one year after the death of Josiah do we read that his son Eliakim did evil in the sight of the, of the Lord in accordance with that which all his forefathers had done. These abominations continued until the fall of Jer Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 587 B.C. 
So up to this point, we see the absolute moral failure of the nations of Israel and Judah concerning not only the sin of infanticide, but also all the atrocities that accompany it. I have brought these historical events into your memory to demonstrate one key point. Abortion, sodomy, transgenderism, all manners of evil lie downstream of a nation's rejection of God himself. There is no law. There is no precept, there is no statute, there is no principle, there is no prohibition, there is no court decision that possesses the power to transform the heart and the mind of sinful men. If we ever hope of rendering abortion illegal, we must first render it unthinkable. If we ever hope to render it unthinkable, we must modify the heart and the mind of man. If we ever hope of modifying the heart and mind of man, we must boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, whenever I say proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm not simply stating that whenever we stand in front of an abortion clinic, we do our best with the time that we get to sufficiently give a gospel presentation to the women who are entering into slaughter the unborn. Whenever I say proclaim the gospel, I am referring to living a life that is one of a living sacrifice. I am referring to the willingness of every believer to give up all earthly goods and pleasures in our commitment to boldly proclaim the lordship of Jesus Christ over every square inch of creation. I am referring to husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church and giving himself up for her. I am referring to wives submitting themselves to their own husbands as unto the Lord. I am referring to married couples to hold their vows of union as something so precious, so valuable, that no man could tear it asunder. I am referring to parents ripping their children out of these godless state-run indoctrination centers and raising them in the fear and instruction of the Lord. I am referring to old men being sober-minded and dignified. I am referring to old women teaching the younger women how to love their husbands and children. I am referring to the young men being good examples with all soundness of doctrine. I am referring to local churches not forsaking the assembling of themselves together and stirring one another up into love and to good works and placing a priority upon true maturity within the bounds of a covenant community. I am referring to pastors who will stand flat-footed upon the scriptures and no thought of any earthly consequences entering into their mind, boldly proclaiming, thus saith the Lord. That's how you change a nation. The true outward proclamation, the living out of the gospel influence upon our lives. Not until those of us who already believe begin to actively live as if we believe will we see the transformation of this culture of death. It starts with us, but it cannot end with us. Our sons and our daughters must be raised with this same focus and mindset as we see throughout Scripture, and particularly in the case of Josiah. The truth is only one generation away from loss. Now, like the forefathers of the faith, we see ourselves living under a political system that has embraced the false gods and deities. The God of sacred scripture has not only been blasphemed and denied, but in many cases just outright forgotten. These governing officials in this political system have not seen fit to acknowledge God and have therefore led the masses into many forms of depravity and debauchery. Contrary to the logical inconsistencies, the United States of America has embraced the slaughter of the innocent as a fundamental human right. It has codified abortion within its laws. It has justified it within its courts. This so-called American nation will not continue 
in its open rebellion against God with impunity. God is holy, and his righteous judgments against this nation are already apparent. Abortion isn't simply a sin that mankind engages in. It is a judgment against a stiff-necked and rebellious people. Any nation that actively and willingly seeks to kill off its own offspring will not be a nation for long. Our own sin and its consequences are judgment against us already. God is turning us over. We have abandoned God Almighty and replaced him with the almighty dollar. And how is that working out for us? Runaway inflation, a failing market, on the brink of a global economic collapse, God Almighty will have this global economy to be his footstool. We have placed comfort and convenience, or as the ancients would put it, prosperity and favor as God and the chief ruler in our lives. Therefore, anything that stands in our way of prosperity and favor must be destroyed. If comfort and convenience are hindered from us, we will not withhold anything in our pursuit of it, not even our own children. As I close, we come back to this statement, is abortion our national sin? Yes and no. Abortion exists as a symptom of the national sin, our rebellion against God and his word. When asked what is the greatest commandment, our Lord Jesus Christ responded to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he said that the second greatest commandment flows from it whenever he said, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We will never love our unborn neighbor as we should until we first love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let's pray. Father, once again, we approach your throne of grace. We humble ourselves, knowing that you are the God of all creation, knowing that you stand in majestic splendor, seated upon your throne, high and lifted up, as the angelic beings never cease crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Father, we stand before you as once sinful men whom you have redeemed and made holy and spotless without blemish by the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Father, we bring a heavy petition before your throne. Father, you know the wickedness, the evil that is perpetrated within this nation that we call the United States of America. Father, we have gathered here today to speak upon one of those issues, the slaughtering of the unborn. Father, we know that this is not our greatest need. This is not our greatest enemy. Our greatest enemy is our own sinful hearts. So, Father, we ask that you would sovereignly, for your good pleasure, that your name might be known amongst the nations, cause us to repent. May we turn from the evil which we are currently propagating in this land. May those elected officials. that reside over their different jurisdictions. May you turn their hearts as you would turn a stream of water. Father, we trust in your sovereign plan.
Father, we know that you will receive ultimate glory and that all of your sons shall benefit because of these things. But would you have mercy upon us? Would you break these stiff necks? Would you replace these hard hearts of stone with hearts of flesh that we may turn to you not only as individuals, but whole churches, communities, regions, states, and as a nation, turn from our wickedness. Turn from our rebellion. Turn from our blasphemies. Turn from the slaughter of the unborn. That this land would not vomit us forth that your judgment would not rain down upon us. Father, we pray with all sincerity that you would change the hearts of our president and his cabinet and all of those ruling in this nation, that you would bring them to their knees, that they may confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior unto the glory of the Father. We ask it in the name of Christ Jesus our King. Amen.